Philosophy for Our Times is brought to you in partnership with the New College of the Humanities, a university-level college offering undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in the heart of London. NCH pride themselves on offering unprecedented access to a world-class academic faculty. Philosophy students at the college are taught by some of the foremost scholars in the field, and one-to-one tutorials create a personalised teaching experience. Choose your major and minor for a unique combined honours degree and study the NCH Diploma to widen your appreciation of the world in ways you never thought of before. Go to nchlondon.ac.uk for more information. Think better. Think NCH. Hello and welcome to Philosophy for Our Times the podcast which brings you the world's leading thinkers to debate today's biggest ideas. Our topic today is to consider whether recent advances in neuroscience can really deliver on the idea of telling us how better to understand all the aspects of the human mind, human cognition, emotions, all sorts of features of our consciousness and experience. Can that be simply explained as a as, as a result of understanding the matter and the mechanisms of the brain. This week, our speakers explore the latest developments in neuroscience to find out if it can provide the answers to who we are. Are we our brains and no more than matter and mechanism? Or does neuroscience still need to account for the experience of life and all the meaning and purpose this entails? Taking this on, we have neuroscientist, poet and author of Aping Mankind, Raymond Tallis, German philosopher and author of I Am Not a Brain, Marcus Gabriel, and neuroscientist and science writer, Susanna Martinez Conde. Please make sure you're subscribed to Philosophy for Our Times to never miss an episode. Head over to iTunes and give us a rating and a review as this helps other people find our podcast. And of course, check out all the episodes we have on offer. Back now to Barry C. Smith, who hosts this week's episode. Meaning, purpose, the feeling of who we are is going to be something that we can hope to capture in neuroscientific terms. And I'm going to ask Ray to start off, please. Barry, thank you very much indeed. My brief answer is no, but you're entitled to a little bit more than that. Because I'm going to argue that our minds are not just what goes on in our brains. And my starting position is that while our brains are a necessary condition for our having minds, and indeed being conscious subjects, they are not sufficient in themselves. So there are therefore serious limitations to what neuroscience can tell us about ourselves. Full disclosure, I was a researcher in clinical neuroscience investigating stroke and epilepsy for several decades. And of course, this has reminded me, as if any reminder were necessary, that the brain is indeed a necessary starting point for our mental abilities. Bash me on the head, I lose consciousness, chop my head off, and my IQ falls a little. Strokes and seizures interfere with functions ranging from the most basic tingle of sensations to the constructed, most constructed sense of self. But that's the beginning, not the end of the story of what we human beings are. So the question you want to ask is, what is the origin of the gap between the necessary and sufficient conditions of human consciousness? Well, it's called intentionality. Intentionality is the aboutness that characterizes mental phenomena. Perceptions are of objects perceived as being out there. Emotions, thoughts, and memories also have this aboutness. Now, there are two important points to make about intentionality relevant to the question of whether neuroscience will eventually explain our minds. The first point is that intentionality is entirely different from anything observed in the macroscopic material world, where the interaction between objects is typically causal. Such causal relationships are seen throughout the brain and are investigated by neurosciences. The light that lands on my retina causes nerve impulses in my occipital cortex. The impact of a stimulus causes a bit of a brain to light up. But causality explains how the light gets into the brain, but not how the gaze looks out and sees illuminated objects. So intentionality puts paid to the famous claim expressed by Daniel Dennett that we can, in principle, account for every mental phenomenon using the same physical principles, laws, and raw materials that suffice to explain radioactivity, continental drift, etc., etc. 
Those physical principles, laws and raw materials, are the very stuff of neuroscience, but they make a poor job, indeed no job, of explaining aboutness. Nor do they explain some of the most basic features of human consciousness. And here's a couple. At any given moment, I'm aware of a multitude of things. My voice droning on, your presence, the pressure of my feet on the floor, a few memories and so on. And they belong to a unified field of consciousness. And there is no neuroscience model of how they're all brought together. And we can discuss that. And here's another. At any given moment, I'm explicitly aware of the past and I'm pregnant with the future towards which I'm traveling. This kind of temporal depth is not seen in material objects, including the brain. The brain at time T1 is the brain at time T1, period. So that's my first point. The second is that intentionality is the seed that opens up a space between the material brain and the human world. This is most evident in, vis in vision, where we register a gap, a distance between what is happening in our bodies and the visual world that surrounds us. But this is just a start. A small difference grows into a big difference. Intentionality or aboutness is developed to an extraordinary and indeed unique degree in human beings. We might discuss the reasons for this, but it is primarily due to the extent to which we share or join together our intentionality. Out of trillions of cognitive handshakes, we create a human world that interacts iteratively with our individual minds. The scale of the, of the distinctively human world is a measure of how far the human mind, the self, the person is from the brain, even though the brain, of course, remains a necessary entrance ticket for our participating in this world. Let me end with a metaphor. To peer into the darkness inside the skull, in an endeavor to understand love, agency, history or culture, is like placing a stethoscope on an individual acorn in the hope of hearing the whispering of the leaves in the wood. One final point, that we collectively transcend our individual brains, courtesy of intentionality, is evident from the fact that we have the word brain, and we even meet to discuss whether or not neuroscience could tell us what we need to know about the mind. Thank you. Ray, thank you. <coughs> Ray's mind or brain was keeping track of that to the second. Very impressive. Thank you. So, uh, Susanna, now we're going to ask you the same question. Do you think that um, issues of higher cognitive functioning, states of meaning and purpose, will eventually be explained in terms of mechanism and matter? So, a lot of the research that we do in my laboratory has to do with the neural basis of perception, with a focus on illusory perception. And due to this, about 10 years ago, I became very interested in the neuroscience of magic tricks, that is, how magic works in the brain. And along the way, I decided that I should start study magic myself, not just as a neuroscientist looking in, but I thought that I should gain the inside perspective of the magician to really see what is entailed with uh, putting together a magic routine. And uh, I ended up auditioning and gaining membership as a magician member of the famous Magic Castle in Hollywood, which was uh, a lot of fun, and, uh, and also a great research investment. But then people started asking me, now that you know so much about magic, do you still enjoy it? Or does now magic feel a lot more mundane and magical? And my answer has always been that, uh, on the contrary, I do enjoy magic a lot more uh, now that I know more about it than before I started studying it. In fact, I didn't really much care for magic shows before I learned about magic myself, and now I find them really fascinating. Now, the reason that I'm telling you this story is that when I was invited to participate in this debate, and I uh, read about some of the questions that we would be addressing today, the, this particular question struck me, are we just our brains? And it reminded me of how so many people think that if they really understand magic, the whole experience is going to be ruined for them. So my 
position in this debate is going to be that uh, yes, our feelings, our thoughts, our emotions, our experiences are the products of our brain, but that doesn't make them any less so. I mean, I am curious why this word just, as in are we just our brains, why does it feel that we are somehow diminished if we are the product of our brain mechanisms? Our art, our science, our humanity, even our philosophy are the products of our brain, and they're intrinsically fascinating. After all, we are a small piece of the universe trying to make sense of itself, and that is huge already, even if there is nothing else than that. We have that. As for the question of meaning, how can life be meaningful if we are our brains? My answer to that is, how couldn't it be? Our brains are meaning-seeking machines. We are wired to find, to link cause and effect, to find purpose, meaning, to make sense of things, whether or not the reality around us is fundamentally chaotic and disorganized. So we can trust our brains to find meaning. Our brains will not fail us. In fact, the hallmark of a healthy brain is that it finds meaning. We wouldn't be here today if we and our ancestors for eons did not feel somehow that life is meaningful and worth living. In fact, one of the ways in which our brains find meaning is by convincing themselves that they are somehow more than brains. Susanna, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Equally impressive timing, so we're setting a good standard now for Marcus. Um, again, the same question, all of these facets of our thinking and reasoning and feeling, will they resist capture in neuroscientific terms? Is this something that will always elude scientific explanation here? Um, yeah, given that the uh, question was slightly different than the one posed to Ray, I can say yes, uh, but I will mean by yes what Ray meant by no. <laughs> <coughs> um, <laughs> However, so uh, let's look at why. So Ray said a lot of things to which I subscribe. So uh, I think um, what he has said about intentionality, w you know, with a few modifications is something I subscribe to. I also agree with him, even though this is very contentious uh, philosophically and uh, scientifically, that the brain is a necessary but not sufficient condition for what I will now call human-mindedness. So let me just tell you what I think the question is about, right? There's this very complicated question, are we, you know, a pack of neurons, etc. But if we even begin to try to answer this question with, uh, you know, a look onto what's happening in neuroscience and in the history of philosophy, including contemporary philosophy, so if we even begin to answer the question, we typically have already settled the meaning of I in am I my brain? Now, what am I, after all, is a good question before we start answering the question whether whatever I am is identical to my brain, right? Well, I think I have a, a justified opinion about who I am. I think I am the animal that you currently see, right? So there's this animal, and it has a past and a future. And uh, now, if I am this animal, then trivially, I am not identical to my brain or any pack of neurons, because I also have fingernails and hands and uh, so forth and a past, etc. So on this level, it's kind of trivial that I'm not my brain, right? So we, have, we need reasons to think that we are, and typically reasons to think that we might be our brains, despite the obvious fact that we are not, uh, <clears throat> they go something like this. Um, well, look, your capacity to identify yourself as the animal that you are, consciously and with the help of you know, meaning-driven linguistic articulation, as the one that I'm currently making use of, that capacity is nothing over and above uh, the uh, activity of a certain part of your brain, be it the central nervous system 
or a part of the brain, etc. We know it's not the brain as a whole because you can cut out certain things from the brain and that is still there. No one knows currently which parts of the brain are the neural correlate of what we call consciousness anyhow, so it's not the case that we can ask current neuroscience in this respect. However, it is true, as Ray said, that if you take out my brain, then my consciousness is gone, right? And probably the whole animal. That will depend on the survival conditions of the animal that I am, whether I am still there. But not as the speaker of this utterance. So let me tell you a little bit more about what I think I am. Okay, so I said I am this animal, but there's slightly more than that, okay? So I'm, I'm also not willing to accept that I'm identical to the animal that you see, okay? I'm clearly not my brain, but I, but I also don't think that I'm identical to the organism that you see. I'm a very specific kind of animal, and so are you, namely a human animal. So what makes us human animals? And now I'm a German philosopher, so I have vocabulary that you don't have. Let me tell you what it is. But I'll translate this in a second, okay, into something that you can understand. So the word is Geist, okay? Um, but let me tell you what it means, okay? Otherwise, it's just a big word. Okay, so Geist is the capacity to lead a life in light of a conception of what kind of animal you are. This corresponds to the definition of sapiens and homo sapiens given to us by Carl Linnaeus, who de defined the human animal by an imperative. He said, know thyself, nos gete ipsum. If you look into his book, Systema Naturae, this is the de definition of the human being. So human beings lead their lives in light of a conception of what it is to be human. Okay? So if you think you have an immortal soul, I don't think I have one, okay? Uh, but if you think you have an immortal soul, you'll do certain things in a certain way, right? You might think that you are currently tested by God, whatever, you know, you'll have problems masturbating because God is <laughs> there and so forth, right? Uh, however, if you think that you're a complicated, intelligent killer ape, okay, which has evolved in a certain way, and your consciousness is, uh, is a good mechanism to spread your genes, you'll behave in a different way. So this capacity to lead a life uh, in light of a conception of what you are is what we call Geist in Germany, and I think this has absolutely nothing to do with anything specifically material about my body. Thank you. So thank you for that. German philosophy made accessible. We had, we had spirit, <laughs> animal, masturbation, it's all in there. <laughs> so, um, so what I want to do now that we've had the positions set out by our speakers, I want to break it down and pursue some of the topics. And I, I want to come back to Marcus and the issue about uh, his, his claim, I'm not my brain. So he set out very nicely the idea that that can't be true because you might be tempted by a kind of animalism a view that you are a, a certain animal, a certain kind of animal, one that has a uh, capacity to be self-aware, to think about, conceive their ends, their values, and so on. So I suppose the question that we want to press you on now is whether uh, instead of thinking of the whole animal, the self that, that you identify with, whether mental capacity, some of mental functioning, is that going to be fully characterized or not fully characterized by looking at, let's give you the whole nervous system and not yeah. just the brain. Yes. Let, let's, let's press on that for a yes. while. Uh, oh, yeah. There, in this respect, absolutely. So I think, for absolutely instance... Absolutely what? Yes, Sorry. absolutely. <laughs> it is absolutely the case that some of the terms we use in order to characterize our mental lives, our human-mindedness, such as sensation, perception, depression, anxiety, and so forth, right? The taste of wine. So some of the vocabulary we use in a human life is going to be such that the best understanding of the meaning of that vocabulary will have to invoke our best neuroscientific knowledge. So I have no doubts about that. Yeah. Uh, precisely, among other things, because the self is an animal. So some animalistic story is going to be true, and animals have evolved uh, in some branches in a very complicated evolutionary uh, genealogy of uh, human beings. So, of course, we'll know something about, for instance, our experience of color, right? I mean, why do we experience certain elements of the light wave as uh, color and other, uh, others as heat, for instance? We don't see ultraviolet, but we feel it as heat. So we can explain this and many other things with the help of neuroscience and medicine and so forth. So quite a bit of the vocabulary that we deploy and think of as specifically mentalistic 
really ref uh, refers to processes in the human organism. Uh, but not all of it, but more than we thought. And neuroscience pushes this border, the more it knows, further into the human mind. But if I'm right, it will never get the whole thing into view, just more and more. So could you remind us why it won't get the whole thing? I mean, you're, you're yeah. conceding that it's the border or boundaries changing, but you want an in-principle reason why it will yes. never achieve everything. Yes, so I there agree, not quite for the same reasons, with uh, Ray's uh, uh, reference to um, intentionality. Mm. So for instance, I am currently aware of being in London, right? So now you can explain what this conscious awareness takes on the side of my brain. There's going to be a certain hormone regulation, my brain has to be in certain states, etc. There has to be a certain dynamism that you can look at, uh, etc. Otherwise, I couldn't be aware of being in London. But given that being aware of London essentially invokes London, right, and London is no state of my organism, it is false to think that you can account for my awareness of being in London by knowing everything about my organism. So if an alien comes to planet Earth and would know everything about the animal that I am, it would not thereby know that I'm aware of being in London. So I'm going to bring in Susanna, but I want to just press you on one part of that, and, and Ray will no doubt have things to say too. Certainly people can lose their sense of being aware of London. We can see things that will mean that that's no longer available to them yes. with uh, neurodegenerative disease. Does that give you any more sense that it's very dependent on the particular organization of the brain? Well, I think this uh, will always tell us more about the necessary conditions of a certain mental state that someone can be in. And that just means that if you take away the necessary condition, you take away the state. Right? So, uh, but you can also destroy London, and then I cannot be aware of being in London. So I might then be under the illusion of being in London, but London might just have been destroyed. Right? I mean, whatever happens... Germans don't do that anymore. I'm no, no, I know, I know. <laughs> you do that yourself now. <laughs> we do that ourselves, yeah, yeah these days. <coughs> yeah. But, but Susanna, could, could, could you come back on this? I mean, there, here we've got a sense that... Um, Although there will be things that neuroscience is able to, uh, to get at, there are, I think, states of aboutness about large and complex objects where somehow we need a constitution relation that involves not just what's going on in us, but perhaps the relation to something outside that won't be captured in purely neuroscientific terms. I think London is fundamentally accidental to the argument, and I think it's actually quite irrelevant because... Um, I may be dreaming about London and I would uh, sustain that that's a conscious awareness about London, even if it's incorrect, I may be in Germany or, or what have you, but I'm still aware of London without London being there. Ultimately, it comes down to the brain processes that are happening. And if the structure of my brain and the neural activity in my brain are indicating that we are in London, then for all I know, I could be a brain in a vat right now receiving appropriate electrical stimulation. In fact, the activity in my brain right now that is telling me that I'm here at how the light gets in participating in this panel uh, would not be any different to what I would have as a brain in a vat if I was having the same type of activity uh, going on in my brain, assuming my, my brain was maintaining a healthy state and so forth, that brain in that vat would believe that it is me speaking in this panel, being in London, and without London actually being there. So the, the reality that is external to our brains, the conversations that we have with people, the air we breathe, and so on, that only matters in that it affects our brain states. So I know that Ray doesn't agree with that, and I suspect uh, Marcus either, but do you want to pick that up as to yeah. whether it's exactly the same state with the same content, whether you're just a brain in a vat and there is no London or even dreaming, and whether you're actually in touch with or seeing or thinking yeah. about London? I'd like to pick that up in the context of something <coughs> excuse me, that Marcus said. It seems to me that uh, there's something absolutely central that the life we lead is actually determined to some extent by the kind of creatures we think that we are. That's what it is to lead a life rather than merely act out a biological prescription. I think that's something absolutely central. 
And where do we get that sense of who or what we are from? We get it from the community of minds. So we have to recognize there is something absolutely central about the community of minds, which is not implanted in a particular brain, that actually shapes the kind of uh, persons that we are. And that's why the brain in the VAT experiment, one of the many reasons thought experiment doesn't work. The first is you have to assume that somebody has put the brain in the VAT, that there is an outside world of people creating this kind of situation. So whereas it presupposes the very things, the outside world, that the brain in VAT experiment plays with suspending. But the other, uh, other thing is that, yes, you could indeed get experiences from stimulating the brain. And let me give you some very striking example from the Canadian neurosurgeon Wilder Penfield. He was operating on patients who had epilepsy. In order to make sure that he wasn't damaging important parts of the brain, he would stimulate the brain while the patients were awake and they could report their sensations. And some patients, when he stimulated them, actually had quite complex memories. And you may think that rather goes against the case that Marcus and I have made against the, bra against the notion that the brain is a sufficient condition of experience. No, it doesn't. These were waking patients, so already wakefulness was present, and they'd had those memories in the normal way, first of all. So let me just end by reminding you about the difference between a necessary and sufficient condition. We're talking about London. In order to be knocked down by a bus in London, I have to be in London. I'm very pleased to say that that's not a sufficient condition of my being knocked down by a bus in London. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Yeah. That's fine, but I want to. <laughs> <laughs> Surely that's true. Exactly. Uh, let, but, but, but I want to press you a little bit on this idea of um, not being a single brain, because even, even if we're not wedded to the idea of brains and vats, there's a lot of social neuroscience going on now where people are interested in the effect of one brain on another. They, they, are you going to feel pain differently if you're aware of another person present? What about a group of people? Can that influence the physiological and uh, uh, mental states of people in a way that's to do with their nervous system? So, I mean, I, I can see one might be against a certain kind of individualism, but, but have you got the wrong target in thinking the only uh, target here would be a brain in a vat? There's something more distributed more social that might sustain some of the things you're talking about? Much more distributed. One of the irritating things you find is the toothache settles down when you go to the dentist. And that's a very good example of the kind of thing you're talking about. Suddenly the toothache matters less. But hang on, why does it matter less? There's a whole institution of the reassurance that we get from people who've been qualified as dentists, etc., etc. And you can already realize that the authority of the dentist and your reassurance comes from an extraordinarily complex society. The society that I've described as being put together out of a trillion cognitive handshakes. We still need our brains, of course, it's a final common pathway, but what our brains are tapping into is something that has been built up over hundreds, thousands of years. And that's the culture that you can't find by looking at the brain. I repeat the metaphor I gave it towards the end of my little talk, trying to look at the brain and finding things like love and wisdom and so on, uh, and it, it's a bit like listening to the acorn through a stethoscope and hoping to hear the whispering woods. The community of minds is absolutely central to what it is to be a human being, and that is not to be found inside an individual brain. Okay, so there's an anti-individualism, but I want to press again the idea of what's missing and what's left out, because, because suppose that Susanna is actually happy to concede to second person and, and, and social neuroscience and, and uh, of course, our, 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 our brains have uh, evolved as part of uh, us being social animals. So we don't live in isolation, but society, our links with family, friends, and so on, that those are going to affect our neural activity. They're going to affect our neuronal connections. If I make a new friend, my brain is not the same as before I made this friend. So ultimately, it comes down to what's happening in your brain structurally and functionally. And as for not being able to find love under the microscope in, in the brain, if you, you can also dissect a heart and you won't find your pulse there. But nobody would deny that your pulse is the direct product of your heart functioning. And the culture is still looking for love, as far as I know. Um, but, but let's go back, Marcus. It, you introduced this tantalizing idea of Geist, which we may or may not wrongly identify as spirit. And it's very easy to hear that as a kind of dualism, that there's something floating free. Now, Ray wants to nail it down in 
handshakes and other people, but, but I suspect you don't quite want to do that. So is it a kind of dualism? Is there something emergent? Is there something irreducible? Is there another kind of stuff yeah. that you're reaching for? Yeah. Well, <coughs> dualism is a tr thorny issue because, uh, you know, like I'm clearly not saying for complicated reasons that there are two kinds of things in the universe, uh, material things and mental things. So n I'm not saying not that saying at all. That. Good. However, I do believe that there are objects that are immaterial, such as uh, the number seven or the fact that I am in London, right? I can think both about London and the fact that I am in London and I ha will have different relation relations to these uh, things. So I think there are immaterial objects uh, and uh, Geist uh, partakes in them. However, given that I do believe that human-mindedness is a state or a series of states that animals can be in, you couldn't have a human mind without having a brain. So this is uh, not dualism, uh, at least of no traditional stripe. However, I do believe that, for instance, take language, right? The meaning, the meaning of our words, such as Geist or soul or the mind or the brain and so forth, the meaning of these words is not identical either to a state that one brain is in or a repetition of states or to a number of states that all brains that have ever, you know, thought that uh, uh, the word brain have been in. Or a relation to things that we interact with? Exactly, yeah. Well, if it were a relation, let's say, let's say the meaning of the term brain is a relation, right? Say between brains and brains. So between brains and brains thinking in terms of brain, right? Between brains and brains. So that, that could be fine. However, the relation is not itself a brain, right? So now you have brain and brains, but between brain and brain, the disquotation is not a third brain. This would be the third brain argument. Um, Let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, we've, we've got enough trouble yeah. as it is. But, yeah. but I'm, still, I'm still trying to understand uh, what you, you said something there about I can't yeah. be a dualist because I accept that yeah. we do have to have a brain. But, but dualists, Descartes in particular, accepted we have to have a brain. And the dualism was precisely because yeah. there was something going on or interacting with that brain. So yes. that, that alone doesn't cut it. No. If dualism, uh, of course, but if, du if dual dualism typically means, right, there are two kinds of things in the universe, yep. right? Mental stuff yep. and non-mental stuff. But I happen to think that there are transfinitely many kinds of things in the universe. There are numbers, cities, earthquakes, uh, bosons, fermions, and so forth, right? So this is not dualism, uh, uh, because I think that the other things that are neither minds nor brains are not reducible to either. So technically, it's not dualism. That's, that's uh, philosophically uh, important, because we should it get it this is on the table. Really. But yeah. remember, numbers, if they're abstract objects, that means they don't exist in space and time. So they don't do any push and pull. So if you want to put yeah. Geist with that, we still have to understand, I think, Susanna, how yes. that would make our bodies move and our appetites uh, flare and so it, on. It comes down to our brain being able to uh, accept input, information, and, and process it. If there is no interface with the brain, whatever else is out there is irrelevant. So. Yes, having a pulse, having a heart rate is not the same as having a heart, but I find that to be kind of trivial uh, in that uh, having a mind is not the same as having a brain, but the mind is the product of the brain, just like the heart rate is the product of the heart. And if you don't have the interface, you're not affecting your brain structure, you're not affecting the brain activity, and then it might as well not be there, just like an uh, infrared light, an ultraviolet light. They're out there, they don't affect us because we don't have the neural machinery to process that information. Yeah. So, so Ray, I want to move on to the, 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 the next theme that we're dealing with, and that's whether or not uh, neuroscience has done some precisification of some of the topics that we're interested in. So if you take topics like uh, uh, perception, uh, taste even, you're, you're dealing with things to do with our emotional states, we actually perhaps have seen some way in which we've precisified and got a better grip on some of these issues. So, so do you think that neuroscience might help us get away from folk concepts that are too loose or don't apply? Or is there always a danger of changing the subject and trying to explain things that we can get hold of? Not merely changing the subject, but losing the subject. And it seems to me that, yes, I suppose there are simple correlations between brain activity and sensations, for example. There are less simple correlations between uh, brain activity and my perception of an object that is important to me. And then you get less and less correlations. 
But the question is, where do we go from here? Where would neuroscience advance from here to understanding the kind of things that I think personally are unique to human beings? So let's have a thought experiment. Suppose in a hundred years' time, we have a complete readout of the total neural activity of someone who's been in love for three months. And we also have a complete description of the connectome, a project that's going on in the EU at the moment, two billion quid, uh, you know, how the brain is wired up, etc., etc. What would be the result of that? Well, one result would be billions and billions of noughts and zeros indicating a neuron's off or a neuron's on. Do you think you would understand anything more about what it's like to be in love, what it's like to be wise or foolish and so on? And the answer is no. So clearly, it's not as if we're going to make much progress to assuming these slightly higher order things from perception onwards uh, by brain science. One final point in relation to perception. The great uh, Hubel and Wiesel, who were the great neurophysiologists of perception, won the Nobel Prize, they ended their lives, I've forgotten which one it was, saying essentially, we don't understand how edge perception and color and the sense of distance and so on all come together in the same spot for me to be able to see that is my cup over there. So we don't even have the beginning of understanding how we unify neural activity or putative neural activity into a perception of an object out there. And that's because there is no way that neuroscience can handle intentionality, which is absolutely fundamental to mind above the level of pure sensation. So Ray's touched on the binding problem, I think, there, uh, putting it all together. But I wonder whether, Susanna, you can think of examples to, uh, to offer Ray where we talk about why there would be some surprises, things that we have in a common sense way thought about vision or thought about our senses actually get revised when we find out how things are actually working. Well, I, I wanted to address first off that uh, Hubel and Whistle did not end their lives because Thorsten Whistle is still alive. Beg your pardon, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, I, did, I did train with David Hubel. Well, there you and, go. Uh, yeah. And to the best of my knowledge, he never said, you know, I give up, uh, who knows what's happening, we can get a handle on it. On the contrary, he and Thorsten Whistle developed functional architecture and they brought structure and function together and sure, they were aware that they had not solved the visual system, but they solved quite a bit of the early stages, and I think they made a major contribution. And neuroscience is not finished, but I think that, uh, and it may be that we don't have the methods, it may be that we need to reconsider a lot of the foundational basis, but, uh, but there's been a, a large amount of uh, very significant progress that has been made, and, and I would, uh, I would uh, also, want to address the, the issue of love and understanding what's happening in the brain when somebody's in love. To be sure, we're not there, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's not achievable. And if we did understand exactly what it means at a, from an, on a neural basis to be in love, I think that it would be much easier to come up with uh, very practical applications, like maybe see people want to fall in love or they want to fall out of love. And if we understand how the brain is doing that, there may be a lot of uh, people that will be interested in gaining some access to the neural processes and, that, uh, and have very real applications. There'll be a lot of pharmaceutical companies interested in that, I think. <laughs> well, no, I want, to, I want to move on to our, our final topic and to, to ask you, uh, uh, Susanna. So, so do we need new concepts when we're dealing with some of the questions that have always interested us? So philosophers will talk about perception and they'll talk about you know, often using vision as the only model. So they'll say, you know, I see an apple in front of me or I'm, I see a tree or a, a human face and so on. But as a visual neuroscientist, might we have to change our categories for what vision is? I mean, I don't know where you stand on it, but if you think of two visual pathways, one for recognizing types of objects and one for acting, might we have to fractionate some of this talk? Might we have to have new concepts of what a visual experience is? Well, you have gotten at the binding problem. I didn't, I didn't address the, the issue that uh, all of these uh, sensory streams, and even within uh, the visual system, we have a form, emotion, and color, and so forth, that they somehow get put together. And we don't have an answer for how that comes about. That doesn't mean that there is no answer. We're just not there yet. In terms of vision itself, uh, I would say that first off, there's a lot more crosstalk 
between uh, these two different streams that was uh, originally believed, even though they're still uh, relatively segregated, at least in the Perhaps in you the could initial just say what the streams are? Oh, um, we're talking about the motion stream and the and the color pathway and, and so on that uh, somehow initially along the visual pathway they're kept, um, I'm simplifying a bit, but uh, they're kept in separate channels and then of course we don't see, um, we see a moving dog, uh, a moving brown dog, we don't see motion here and then separate from it the concept of uh, or the perception of brown as the dog's color, it all becomes integrated, that's the binding problem, how do all of these different elements come together and that's, uh, that's a big one to, to resolve which, uh, which we don't have yet, but, uh, but I want to go back to vision and, that, uh, and just say that in my own um, a research, we were talking about it uh, in the in the green room, that we see even that we may think of something that is uh, a, its own a compartment, visual perception. It's uh, there's a great interlink with our with our eye movement. So vision itself is a very active process. We don't just uh, open our eyes and see the world, but we actively sample visual information through through our gaze and through our eye motion. So so we need to, to think about all of these uh, visual and temporal aspects coming together. And, and perhaps we wouldn't have the same visual scene if our sense of balance of our vestibular system wasn't working. We wouldn't be anchored even though we were getting visual information. It wouldn't it wouldn't feel or look the same. So so there's a lot more to do, but I want to ask Marcus about this idea. He he brought up the idea of who I am and self. But I'm wondering whether we also need some new concepts there because we might have a concept of self, very big in philosophy, but we might distinguish that from a sense of self. And perhaps you could have the latter without there being anything referred to by the former. And then even with sense of self, philosophers working with neuroscientists like Sean Gallagher have distinguished a sense of agency when your limbs are moving from a sense of ownership. Is that my limb? And we see with various pathologies people who've got one without the other. So, so do we need neuroscience to provide us with new concepts, even to get the phenomenology and the philosophy focused in the right way and what we're interested in? Well, I think this has <coughs> a much less philosophical impact than uh, many philosophers uh, believe. Um, so I think, uh, of course, we should take into account what we know about humans, right? For medical reasons and because we are curious and interested in facts and so forth, right? Uh, and uh, this can lead us to introducing a philosophical term such as a sense of self and say something like, you know, like if I dream I have a sense of self, right? Uh, it's possible, we don't know whether this is actually empirically possible, that a brain in a vat would have a sense of self. We don't know these things, by the way, and uh, what you have just said about uh, uh, human vision uh, tells me that it's empirically even false. So if we need uh, movement, eye movement, and so forth to have vision, then brains in a vat couldn't have vision as a uh, matter of empirical fact. So uh, these are interesting facts about humans, and we should take them into account. And sometimes this can have consequences for our philosophical conceptions, but I think fundamentally the answer is indeed no. Um, what so about, what yeah. about uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein saying, yeah. a man could not be in pain and wonder whose pain it is, and yet we have patience who have alien hand syndrome, they yeah. think this isn't their own hand. If you yeah. prick them, there's pain, and you say, yeah. is there pain? Yes. Whose yeah. pain is it? I don't know. Maybe it's yours. Yeah. So was yeah. Wittgenstein wrong to say that? Oh, yeah. That's, uh, pain is a wonderful issue, of course, because it's one of the best known cases, both in uh, natural science and philosophy, to uh, come to terms with our you know, philosophical concept used there. So I do disagree with uh, Wittgenstein's uh, way of putting it. So I think he's making philosophical mistakes, right? And they can be corrected with reference to some of the things we now know. Um, this has big consequences indeed because we understand much better, which was known in philosophy uh, ever since people starting, uh, started thinking about the non-conscious contribution to human thought, right? I mean, you get this from Plato onwards, the realization that uh, there are two kinds of things. The one thing is the state that you're in and uh, the overall perceptual or mental state that you're in. And then there's an additional state that you get 
activated into when you become aware of that state. And neuroscience helps us to understand that this is the right philosophical model, right? There are debates in philosophy about whether this is the right model for self-consciousness. Are there two kinds of states that you're in when you become aware of your awareness, or is this just one state? I think neuroscience helps us to push the evidence in the direction of what philosophers call anti-luminosity. That just basically means that the state that you're in and your knowledge of that state are two states. That's why I generally hold, among other things, inspired by conversations with my colleagues in neurobiology, that there's no state that you can actually be in such that you cannot be wrong about that state. And Wittgenstein and Descartes and many other people thought that the mind is precisely the kind of entity that has some privileged states, whatever they are, pain, right? Um, and I think there aren't any such privileged uh, uh, um, states. My arguments for that do not rely on neuroscience. I, if I gave you my arguments, they wouldn't refer to neuroscience, but I think neuroscience nicely confirms okay, this good. philosophical view. So, so I think we've got, we've got at least clear where the speakers are. So, so, so maybe we could say that Marcus thinks that neuroscience might be useful for getting the evidence or the phenomena right to start philosoph philosophizing in the right way. We, if, if we've got the right thing in view, and neuroscience might help us, that will do. Susanna thinks even our philosophizing and the things that we're doing, that's, that's going to be a product of the brain and that with a bit of luck and optimism, we might get to understand how we can do that. And Ray thinks that somehow or other, our culture more widely is going to be part of the distribution of mindedness uh, impinging on individuals and that nothing entirely about the brain is going to satisfy. So, now will you join me in thanking our speakers, Raymond Tallis, Susan martinez Conde, and Marcus Gabriel. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Philosophy for Our Times. The podcast was brought to you by the Institute of Art and Ideas. It was hosted by me, Anna Carey, and our guests this week were Raymond Tallis, Marcus Gabriel, and Susanna martinez Conde. As ever, please do let us know what you thought of this episode, Make sure you subscribe to Philosophy for Our Times and of course tell anyone you know that might be interested. Tune in next week for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.